How, how terrible are you feeling? Oh, uh, look, on a scale of one to ten, not not that terrible. <laughs> You look like a podcast producer, actually, in the car. Oh, yeah. In yeah. the car. <laughs> like, imagine at the start of Gimlet Media, when he was, like, doing the startup podcast, he'd always record himself in his car, and you didn't see the, the visual of it. It's kind of what I imagined. It's a pretty good recording environment, really. It's very dead. Yeah, it is. It's good. It's and this, because I'm in the electric, I can just run the heater flat out. Ooh. It's great. Yeah, you keep it plugged in, and then... Yeah, we charge it. Oh, we're not driving it at the moment because we're in isolation, but <laughs> I've got 180 kilometers on the on the range. So, yeah, it's a lot of heating. Well, it's there yeah, forever. I'll be all right. Yeah. How's your week? It's pretty good. Better. I think, I, I don't remember if we talked about this last week, my life has been kind of all over the place. There's a ton of rain last week and it kind of caused some trouble at my house. So I had mm. to race home one day and deal with that and luckily nothing happened damage wise that's been a little chaotic and i don't know things have settled down here luckily i found a forklift driver or sorry not a forklift driver that'd be weird <laughs> i found a forklift mechanic that's kind of an independent contractor or has his own business rather than these big companies and he's fantastic he fixed my battery problem uh, i had two shorts Who's somewhere up by the ignition i don't know he tore the whole thing apart basically and it was like you know more than me fixing it obviously but i think i probably would have taken about three days and not found all of it and he did it in two hours i think it's pretty awesome in that regard right he wasn't charging that lawyer money no no this is the great thing is it's like he's probably making decent money on his rates and they were Good. i said this to ricky they're comparable to what we charge so it's like yeah. it makes sense that somebody else does their profession for the rate somewhat close to what we charge to do their profession. I was happy. Super happy to have found him. He also told me almost immediately when he got there that two or three other things that I wanted the other companies to look at didn't need to be worried about. He's like, those oh, are fine. Cool. You don't need to worry about it. And I was like, go. Oh, all right. Sold. Awesome. That's how, about, how about you? I mean, there's a little bit of a situation on your side, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there might be a little bit of that. Yeah, we have managed to avoid COVID for whatever it is, two and a half years now, and finally caught up with me, or finally caught up with the business. So there's been two of us out this last week. I'm on my sixth sixth day of quarantine. We have to do seven days hmm. here as a minimum, and then they let you out if you're symptom-free. So, yeah, hopefully... Coming into the weekend here, and hopefully I'll be all clear by Monday and able to go back into the shop. But yeah, it's been a a week off back here, which you know it's kind of been being sick's never fun. But yeah. at the same time, it's been you know good downtime to sort of think about some stuff and get the sketch pad out and mm -hmm. try and not go on too many YouTube benders yeah it's been pretty weird i felt kind of mildly drunk the whole time it's been a pretty weird feeling so i've swung wildly between sort of optimism and pessimism at different times about lots of different things but for the most part it's, you know what my body needed to do so it's a lot of I'll time to think i'm sure that's right yep. has the rest of your family received the blessing <laughs> No, thankfully, only my daughter's come down with it so far. And she's had it before, and she bounced back. She <laughs> bounces back pretty fast. Fine in the day. Yeah, pretty much. Well, that's good. I think you had said right at the end of us talking last time, I think you maybe had gotten like a message about it. You remember you looking like at your phone or something, and you're like, <laughs> oh, no, I just found out somebody got COVID. <laughs> Yeah, that was literally the moment as we were going <laughs> off the podcast last week where I found out one of the others had come down with it. And then, yeah, we sort of took matters into our own hands at that point and all, we all masked up and started doing rapid antigen tests at work and then i came down with it a couple of days later but yeah. thankfully no one else in the team has so far so it's meant that everyone's been spent the week powering on without us and it sounds like it's all gone pretty well so that's been really good it's relieving it's always yeah, nice in those situations when i'm sure you have to a, a greater extent it's like when things are set up well enough that you don't have to be there for it to work and mm. especially when you get to that place of i don't have to worry about that happening even yeah it was pretty good this time around i was so out of it on monday morning that i kind of forgot that i'd written a list for this <laughs> particular occasion <laughs> and so it was i was handing sort of production over to ben i was, I was calling him from the tent 
<laughs> and I was so out of it. I was just like, Hey, can you just take over? He was like, yeah, sure. I got it. Did you, did and, you um, work from the tent? Like on a laptop? No, nah, no. Nah. I've done very little work. It's good. Really just haven't, I haven't felt like it, but also just haven't really been capable of it. Like, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Ed's headspace has been pretty, pretty <laughs> wacky. I think um, that's pretty common. Yeah. So Ben t- took over and I'd kind of forgotten that I'd written a contingency plan in Airtable for this specific moment of when these are the key things I do every day that form mm-hmm. part of my role that I'm handing to you sort of thing. Anyway, didn't matter. Sounds like they went, they went fine. Yeah. That's good. There's a couple things that can't really happen without me. And I remember having mm-hmm. a very concerned conversation. I think my wife and I were hiking. And I was just like really stressed out when COVID had just hit its full force in the early days. And I mean, yeah, I don't know. In a certain sense, there's, I still haven't resolved some of them, which is kind of sad. If I get hit by a bus or get COVID, payroll doesn't happen. Yeah. And I remember, I think I kind of resolved that, but I didn't fully. And then some of the other things I forget now, uh, sales things invoicing can't really happen so we could basically continue work until we ran out and then people would have to like pay via (laughs) here's some cash you know like on a piece of paper yeah that's a good i should probably a smart idea to put down some justin needs more contingency contingency plan yeah i mean it's a pretty big deal to be able to fully replace yourself even for a week it's definitely taken us a long time to get to that point where that's not incredibly disruptive for sure. Yeah. You need to have a lot of either people or systems in place, I guess. But yeah, even just having a simple plan, I think is a good, good thing for everyone to do. Yeah. I'd love to get to a point where everyone in the business has kind of got that list of like, cool, we don't have to wor- worry when someone with unique skills or unique tasks drops out for, you know, it goes on holiday. It's like, cool. Yep. Our business manager is going on holiday in a couple of weeks for a week. And I know that she's documented the Mm. crap out of everything. And so that when it gets to that week, I'm just going to basically get a handover document of like, cool, this is, these are the key things I do every day to keep things ticking along. These are the priorities. I do that whenever I know I'm going like like a vacation, I make, Mm. here are all the things I expect to happen. And, you know, these things need to be done. And for some reason, I don't think, unless unless I'm delirious in this moment like you are, <laughs> that I don't remember actually doing one for COVID. Ricky was, I think he was precautiously out for a couple of days because of his significant other had yeah. something potentially or we thought. And so he stayed home and I was like, man, we need to really have the, a plan of a backup of things that you can work on remotely because I've always had this thought of where he mostly works in the shop, but he also has pretty good fusion skills now. Design as well as cam. He has a computer at home. It's remote. I don't expect it to be like perfect, but I don't know how you have all dealt with this, but there's really no formal thing going on here about what you should do, you know, in the States. It's like you don't have to give anybody time off for it. You don't have to pay for them, you know, to recover. And it just feels a little crappy that if they want to do the right thing and stay away from the rest of everybody else to stay, that they're punished for not getting work time. We did talk about that, at least having some kind of contingency of like, what could you work on if you weren't here? Uh, It's a good idea. We kind of, in the earlier days of the pandemic, when we basically stayed open the whole time because manufacturing was able to, but a lot of other industries got shut down. There were a couple of weeks there where we elected to pack up and go home because it felt too risky. Yeah, at the time we encouraged, yeah, it would have been good to have more of a plan, but it was it all happened very quickly back then. And we yeah. basically sent sent everyone home with the plan to get yep. better at fusion. So there was a period of time there where that was sort of actively encouraged by the business. These are things you can do mm-hmm. on the clock, even like yeah, this, this would be valuable to the company if you got better at fusion sort of thing. So, we had a couple of moments of that where people had... Uh, there's a person that worked here mostly in the shop, but had fusion skills and they transitioned to work from home, figured out a way that they could start doing distanced work. And that was like the first time I had ever had that experience because I do it myself sometimes, but I'd never set up anything for anybody else. Yeah, nice. Maybe this is a good next one, but the, which hire was most impactful. Mm, yeah, that kind of leads in. Hey, I suppose the biggest change for us in terms of that sort of shift in systems and thinking was when 
we hired Sarah, who yeah. mm-hmm. was our business manager. 2016, I ran a job ad on Instagram, which was me, like with an orbital sander gaffer tape to my foot, a phone in one hand and a nail gun in the other hand and like trying to do everything at once. And I think Sarah was the only applicant who didn't see that ad because she's not on social media. <laughs> and she kind of came left of field through a friend of a friend as a contact and was just like a real game changer for us. I don't know that we really knew what we needed other than that we needed help with admin and sort of relieving my time on the admin side of things. And Tara came from sort of a professional sports admin background, which was, you know, we would have never expected to have hired someone from somewhere like that, but it was just the perfect fit. Anyway, I think in hindsight, I remember sort of years in the years after that thinking, why did it take me so long to hire someone to help with this side of the business? And I think I'd, I'd sort of been, whenever we'd had the opportunity to hire someone or bring someone in, A, it had always been very organic of like, oh, you're a, you're a warm body. You say you need work. We need things done. Yeah, come, come help us. So it was kind of sort of very informal and just kind of spur of the moment often. But the other thing that was going on was that I was always hiring people to do what I could do. Yeah, at the end of the day, trying to find clones of myself, like who would be good at doing, making things. Mm -hmm. And after hiring a business manager, I sort of, it kind of clicked. I was like, oh, right. Yeah, no, I should have, I should have hired someone like this a long time ago because it frees up my time. If I'm the highest performer in the business in terms of which I was at that time of just sort of getting stuff done. Yeah. 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 Then it it just made so much sense to free up my time to have more time in the workshop to produce or do that higher level work. So yeah, that was kind of a tipping point. And then, you know, I think from that point we have become, well, Potentially too admin heavy over time, but there's all sorts of complexities tied up with that. I think, as I mentioned the other day, like going from working six or seven days a week and then having kids and deciding that that was not sustainable and trying to sort of pull back to more normal hours has meant that naturally I've had to sort of delegate out some of that, more of that sort of admin duty to other people in the business, which has meant we've become quite had been heavy at times and we're always kind of fighting to get enough production hours in the mix, mm. if that makes sense. Interesting. I don't know. Yeah. I can definitely relate to basically everything you said and I'm sure everybody goes about it differently or in their own way. I had that thought for sure. I think basically every time I've ever hired somebody, except for when they didn't work out a couple of times was like, why didn't I do this sooner? And I, mm. I think Saunders said this forever ago that you should hire six months before you think you need it. If you're in the best position that you possibly could, (laughs) right? It either will take you that long or you'll be in trouble by the time you get there with needing support. I don't know. It doesn't, honestly, isn't that like realistic for me? It never really works out that way. But I did the exact same thing when I hired the first employee. And I think probably the one after one and one after that was I basically split up in my head right now for portland cnc i'm doing cam and quotes yep. and i'm doing production which is you know a list of things making stuff in the shop where they're with a machine typically with a cnc is the starting point and then you know, other things with that and i was like i got to replace one of these sides right like somebody's got to do the other side and i mean i don't think it makes any sense to be fair to both of us to hire an admin person when you're the only one of the only production people at the time, right? Like if you're adding another person to one, (laughs) you don't add an admin person right then. Usually I think there definitely is a place. I'm very, I was very curious to see what your answer was to what made the biggest difference, but I'm also curious. I don't have kids, but I am working very much like a dog still, right? Like all the time. And it doesn't ever seem like that. It's going to end anytime soon Mm. because you had a constraint of kids potentially let's just say that was the maybe the catalyst and you wanted to make a change what actually made that difference that it was either profitable or was it already profitable for you to not work like that and hire somebody else or did you make another Mm. change that made it that way good question and Honestly, I, I'm not going to know the answer because sure. we didn't know our finances well enough back then. Like literally we've only sort of gotten to the point 15 years into the business where we know kind of that balance, mm-hmm. that financial balance data Yeah. in terms of production versus admin and mm-hmm. total, you know, fixed 
fixed cost versus um, the Soft. other ones. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, the other <laughs> ones. <laughs> Soft like my brain. So I don't can't really answer that, but I think, yes, you know, working crazy hours, pre-business manager, yes, the business was profitable. And in hindsight, it was probably, I probably could have dialed back at that point. Yeah. A little bit in terms of how I was working, but yeah, no, absolutely. There's a, there's a, a crossover point. Like you say, like it doesn't make sense to go out and hire an admin role when it's just you or mm -hmm. probably just when it's you and a couple of other people, there must be, and I don't know the maths off the top of my head, but there's going to be a sweet spot there where it's right. Cool. Like we've got now, depending on our, you know, fixed costs and yep. our production hours, it makes sense now to like roll some of that into an admin role, but yeah, yeah. Mm, it's tricky, tricky thing to know when is the right time, I guess. Hey, for sure. Yeah. Like I've got business owner friends who rely, you know, effectively still doing it all themselves, but turning over way more than we are. And they rely heavily on subcontractors, like external bookkeepers, external, you know, keeping everyone kind of as a semi external subcontractor so that the business can kind of, kind of flex and move as they need it to, as opposed to taking on internal payroll staff. We always went down the internal payroll sort of route because, you know, at some level I liked having a team and that dynamic and having people on call at all times to sort of grow and yeah. implement ideas and things like that, but oh, for there's sure. different ways to do it. That's interesting. On Sarah, right? Your business manager. Mm. Was it beneficial that she was out of the industry? Like, do you, do you think that was beneficial or just coincidence? Um, look, I think it was good to have an external sort of skill set, but then it probably could have come from any industry, whether that had been from manufacturing or, or, or sports admin as it was, it, it was so different to what we'd been doing. <laughs> like I still joke with Sarah now about like how frightened she was of, of my filing system. Like file my, files or papers? Yeah, paper, file, paper files and receipts. My system was pretty much just stuffing them in a plywood box and then at the end of the financial year kind of bumbling them all up into a plastic bag and labeling them that financial year and Classic. then starting a fresh box. Yeah. I think, you know, anyone who'd come in professionally at that point would have been a breath of fresh air and, yeah. you know, bringing new skills and new systems. I don't know that coming from an external industry was specifically an advantage and I'd look, I'm sure there'd be advantages in hiring someone from that industry too, for sure. How have you sort of been close to looking at that in the past or what? I feel like I've been all over the place in terms of. I wouldn't call it experimenting, but I know what I'm good at and what I think I can be best at. Mm. And I've, since I started by myself, it was always like, what is the most complimentary over time? I've gotten to this place of like, what's complimentary to that? And the last person that was kind of a friend needed a, a stop before starting his own thing. And he was kind of a perfect scenario from when we were trying to start up our little product design studio again and Andy's his name and he had run a machine shop and done a lot of kind of high-end proper machining we had just got in the mill he'd done operations management kind of stuff so not business management but more like internal processing and making things work and that was kind of experimental but also really helpful he got a lot done but it also at the end of the day I don't know that that was maybe like the perfect fit I'm always at the end of it like should I have hired <laughs> marketing? Should I have, hi you know, it's like, I never really feel like I'm aside from the, maybe the first hire, which it was like, I need somebody to help me, like just do anything. And that's kind of how it's been. A lot of the time is there's another person that is also wears eight of 10 hats in some fashion where they either can make yeah. and do a lot of things and do cam and do shipping. And, and those people are kind of invaluable to me. Not that oh, yeah. some of them aren't, but the people that are really flexible and willing to do anything, Ricky's always has the best attitude. So it's like, whatever you want, I'll do anything. I'll do it well. And that's fantastic. But I, yeah, I'm at this place now, actually kind of maybe transitioning to this next topic is I think I need help with marketing and advertising 
is my best take at this point. Mm -hmm. And we have products that we're either making or want to sell. And I feel like I've hit my wall of what I know how to do to market them, whether it be Mm, Facebook ads or, you know, trying to make organic media that seems to be the king right now, like TikTok and stuff like that. And I just don't have the bandwidth left for it, you know? And so I've been kind of exploring whether that means do we hire somebody to try to work for us internally or is it a freelance person or is it some there's all these new services where you like you tell them what you need and they try to pair you at some cost. That's kind of where I'm at right now with hiring. Yeah, I don't know. You I don't know which of us wrote down the advertising thing. I think yeah, it's tricky, huh? Like you can do like you're so good at systems, like and building your own systems. And having that, you know, that small crack team of people who can just get on and do anything. It is such a powerful model, I think, when you're at that scale. And if you then feed the right sort of mix of work into that, you can go a long way with that, that small, like agile business model, I think. Yeah. It only becomes too much admin wise i think if you're potentially if you're feeding the wrong sort of work in like yeah if you're getting the right sort of work and it's easy for you to process through the systems you've built then you know that yeah you can get so much out of that machine yeah marketing marketing's a strange world <laughs> in my delirious state in the last few days i watched the social dilemma for the first time oh yeah so i'm, I'm feeling pretty weird about for sure all of that at the moment but my gut feeling with getting help with that would be to find a subcontractor that can just help you a little bit here and there as you need initially and kind of work out you know establish your your how you're going to do it yeah i've always struggled with that like i don't i really like making the content for those platforms sure I've always enjoyed shooting stuff. I'm very happy behind a camera or in front of a camera as need be. And I can't imagine sort of hiring someone to come in and do like content creation for me. And I've dabbled with that in the past. Like I've had moments where I've like, oh, if someone could just, if someone on the team could wrangle a camera, that'd be so much better because then they could just document products and shoot video and stuff. And I've tried with it in the past and the feedback's always been like very quickly we lose either my voice or my yeah. my visual aesthetic that sort of butter is yeah has grown grown <laughs> up with so yeah i don't know where the best mix is what do you want like hmm. if you could do you have an idea what i know is i mean from making products since 2011 in some fashion is either i have found a few things that we can have other people make and are profitable or that's how i kind of started out with things is other manufacturers make stuff that we designed and sold it and those were always profitable cool that sounds no way braggadocious it's more like we still have that situation where we've designed different things the problem is i think they're good enough they're good let's say they never scale we never get to this place where it's like oh we keep selling more we need to make more yeah I, we can't keep up. I need to hire people to make more. It's always like just kind of feels like this trickle of of sales, mm. especially as we were trying to transition to, you know, doing that more as a full time part of our business. I feel like there was just nothing to rely on there. Yeah. And my experimenting with advertising in different ways, marketing just always feels like I'm spending more money than I'm making back on it. And I hit yeah. this. I'll start to sell something, you know, like a Facebook ad will start to work and then it just stops. And I'm like, what? happened like why i don't know it's not really a great answer other than i i want somebody to help us take that i i could still come up with the ideas to you know and shoot Mm. the videos like you're saying i still like that part i just don't i feel like i'm hitting a wall too often yeah that's a big one it's like why did the ad stop working like (laughs) that's a question that comes up for us because we never advertised and we had that same feeling of like it's just a slow trickle 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 and then over years and years some of those products sort of build up to like quite substantial mm-hmm. annual sales, but totally from that sort of trickle effect of just like word of mouth, you know, a little bit of organic stuff on Instagram, getting the word out there. But then, yeah, just in the last 12 months, we've kind of had our first sort of foray into advertising, digital marketing, primarily through Facebook ads, and now a little bit through Google search, paid search. But that's, 
<laughs> that's, that's still, it's still the biggest question of like, what October was so good. What happened? It's like, it's like, brrr, it falls off. So yeah, I think if you're going to find someone to help you with that stuff, you need to find someone who can help you answer those questions. Yeah. But that said, like we do have someone who helps us with that and they're great. Even still, it's such a complex, <laughs> seems to be such a complex environment. It's very hard to get those answers. So we, we pulled a bunch, we, we've kind of had a modest little spend that we've rolled out every month for the last, you know, whatever it's been, probably nine months. And we've played with it in different ways and pushed more of it here and more of it there. And at the start of the year, we were frustrated by that, spending that money with Facebook. I always felt quite dirty about that spend. Yeah. I don't like advertising, but having seen the results from a few of those good months, it's like, right, okay, we know it's possible. There were moments there where we could see it scaling, like, like, oh, cool. Okay. This is, this is working. I can mm. see how this works now. And then it drops off. And so we were quite frustrated by that, by the start of this year. And so we pushed the majority of our spend into Google paid search. Mm -hmm. Just the difference between those two platforms was quite striking in terms of the back end. They're like, have you played with the back end of both of those? What was the other one? Facebook and a Google paid search. Oh yeah. A little bit. Yeah. It's changed a little bit. I've been playing a little bit more with, I tried to do advertise something recently product on Google that mm. I'd never really done. It's been a long time. And that first, my first attempt was a complete failure. It's probably <laughs> five, $700 and just nothing mm. just disappears yeah. yeah and my impression switching to google as our primary spend was the interface was much more sort of transparent mm. and i liked the fact that we weren't serving ads to random people in their facebook feed we were serving ads to people who had searched for a bookshelf or a table or you know yeah. something related like Someone was actively going out there on the internet and looking for a thing. And then we're serving an ad to them saying, Hey, we, we make a thing you might like our thing. And that I feel as, as dirty as I feel about the whole advertising thing. I feel much better about that model than the, just the scroll, scroll, scroll. Oh, here's an ad scroll, scroll, scroll. Like, and yeah. I know it's more, I know it's more complex than that in terms of how people are being selected, but still. It does um, make, I mean, that makes some sense too. I mean, I know enough from. My most successful foray into advertising was when I was starting that intro to CNC course online. Yep. And I, it's the only time I've ever tried advertising where I was in the pre-sale days. It was like a couple months. I did it kind of trickled it out. I was also doing other things. There was two and a half months where I was getting like six. I think the best was six our ROAS. So it was basically like six times my ad spend versus, you know, coming back to me it was fantastic and i was like this is gonna go so well and i was like <laughs> so excited and then it was basically like a logarithmic like drop after that and mm. now it's just i keep it real low and it continues to trickle in people that are interested but no, the sales don't happen really it's just leads mm. for people that might be interested in that and i don't know what the hell changed pricing could have changed a little bit but other than that i don't understand because it wasn't even published at that point you know it was maybe it was like the FOMO factor. I think there's definitely a thing with the pre-sale. Yeah. FOMO, whatever it is. There's definitely something that happens there. I've found that with product launches, you know, Kid Parts has been our most successful product launch by far. Part of that was, you know, a year of storytelling on Instagram of like just developing the means and ways to make that product. Yeah. And then kind of organically arriving at a point where like, oh, we've made a thing. Who wants to buy it? We're only, you know, we're only going to sell eight of them. And then that, you know, sold out and overnight, basically. But I think that sort of long lead time of a story that sort of developed into a product. Anecdotally, I reckon there is something about the pre-sale model that generate more interest or more activity. I mean, there must be a reason why Kickstarter and all those platforms are a thing, right? Yeah. They're huge. Yeah, for sure. No, it's one of my friends here has done a couple of them. I've done one. It was forever ago, so it's completely changed. And they've they did one more recently. And I was asking them whether they thought it was a good idea for us to try the knack wall on Kickstarter. And I, most of what I'd heard the last few years was, eh, probably not. Like skip it. And that's what their okay. take was was just unless you're 
in the perfect scenario, well, what I knew even back when we did it in 2011 is you're still generating most of your own interest regardless. Yeah. And so you're just giving away roughly 10% of your income between the fees to somebody else. So if you're going to do that, the chances that you're going to get like, you know, put on the front page of Kickstarter pretty low unless you have the perfect product, I guess. Yeah. So anyway, that's kind of what I'm hoping happens, I guess, too. I haven't shared as much as I probably should have through the process, but we've been developing this product that I don't know that our people that follow Portland CNC probably aren't the perfect customers for it, but yeah. I, it's maybe you've had this experience too, where it's like maybe in the earlier days where the customers for one product are not the customers for another product. And so your existing customer base doesn't really go, oh yeah, I'd love that. Because I, I seem to keep coming out with completely random things. It's just that's <laughs> the way my brain works. And it's like the last thing was a whiteboard and it hasn't sold exceptionally well. It kind of goes along with this weird like office products thing I have a obsession with, I guess. I just, yeah, I don't, without having enough data, I guess I don't understand it's either a bad product or it's not pushed in front of the right people at the right time. Mm. This is what yeah. I always think about. Yeah. Hard yeah, to know. I think I've. I forget how many people are, are out there because you kind of get stuck in your little bubble of what you're used to and like what you think the market is. But I think there's definitely uh, my reaction to you saying that is that you you just need to get your products in front of the right people. Yeah, I hope so. And work out who those people are because it's like they're great products. They're really well made. Like it's just a matter of, yeah. Getting the right eyes on them, I think, because I think you and I are probably similar in a, in a way of like, I don't know about you, but my Instagram following, whilst it's, it's a really powerful thing that's kind of organically built up, a lot of that activity is just other makers yeah. or other people who are interested in making mm -hmm. who are like, oh, that's cool. Or that's a cool way. Like, I really like how you're doing that. Or yep. that's a great technique. And obviously there's some sneaker interior designers and people <laughs> Who might specify us and I wish. sitting there, sitting there in the background. But I think you're probably, I'm guessing you're probably similar in that respect of like, you've got a lot yeah, of I mean, fellow makers and CNC enthusiasts. Uh, yeah, no, I think it's the same. I mean, I think, you know, a couple accounts, the knack one is pretty small. It's like 1200 people and I don't really post there, which I should. You should. <laughs> and yeah. And the Portland CNC one's always been easier for me to just go, here's what we're making. You want to see it? Yeah. You know, like it's very easy, less, maybe you can relate to the like, you're different, I think, than I, I, I think I have too much of like a feeling of preciousness to share the things on Knack that I'd ever feel like I, like the process doesn't seem as relevant. I'm changing that mindset, mm -hmm. but it's taken me a while. Whereas the CNC stuff, so I just been like, we're making a sign. Anything is content in my mind. And yeah, but yeah, no, it's not the same. I would love to have a especially with the wall trying to sell that. It's like, I would love to have a follower base of just interior designers that want to specify it. That'd be amazing. <laughs> yep. I think that's something to be said though, even isn't that focused audience of just being genuine and, you know, doing that thing of just showing what's exciting or what you're working on at that time. I think that's, yeah. that's a really powerful thing that gets across to everybody. I think people tune into authenticity and excitement and people who are there making things because that's what they want to do yeah mm. i continue to try to remind myself that sometimes we'll have a client pick up a job and they're like oh this place is amazing and i'm like oh is it yeah. it seems small yeah, to me no. you know like <laughs> i wish i had more space it's kind of dark i'm really lucky to have so many amazing tools to use every day and i just mm. kind of always focus on what's ahead of me rather than like you know even in sharing sometimes and i feel like i've done an okay job of thinking of it as like well there's always somebody potentially new or a group a big group of people that don't do this every day and they're just interested to see what you know what is it what what has this machine work and mm. the people that already know about it can either keep going or make an angry comment which you get a little of both at least in the states yeah i have to remind myself that all the time that not everybody has multiple cncs to play with yeah i know it's easy to do isn't it it's yeah. great to have external people come through the workshop for that reason i think you get you see their eyes light up and you're yeah. like oh that's right yeah i guess that is cool i think you're really good at that in terms of you've got that ed educational bent on your content already mm. So the way you sort of explain the process to things or, you know, it goes from this software to this machine or like 
because you're trying to sort of educate people on yeah. process naturally, I think that comes through nicely. Thanks. But yeah, I definitely, definitely have that sense when <laughs> we have someone new come through the workshop and giving them the tour, it's like have a chat to them and then, yeah, it's a nice reminder, I suppose. Yeah. To be like, yeah, cool. I made this. Yeah. yeah, no, it is. It, and it's been, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, I don't want every day for there to be a tour. Right? Like, it's really distracting, mm. you know, but it's been far too... Like I wanted to have more, I don't know, local community based things from 2019 when we moved into the shop. We basically have had a poor time to have people come over since then. Yeah. And we were always hoping to do more training things. Like I'm hoping in the next couple months, we're going to start doing like in-person training if it's oh, cool. still seems safe. But that was always one of the thoughts. And then there's, yeah, local maker groups that we've been approached early on, you know, when we moved here, like, hey you're already doing this stuff and you're coming to these events. Do you want to host one? I was like, yeah. And then literally like COVID shut all that Mm. down. So we've always wanted to be more involved and it's just really, we've been really closed up trying to stay safe as we can here. Yeah. Someday, hopefully again. Yeah. Hopefully. I didn't realize you'd moved just before the pandemic. So it's similar timing for us. It takes about a year to get a workshop up to a point where you feel like you can have people in, I think. Right. Oh man. Yeah. My other piece of news that i'm beaming with pride Ooh, about what, here what is, is so sure i have made it's not my first aluminum part by any means but That's i designed beautiful. this and also rigid tapped it which is a first <laughs> and one of the more terrifying things i've done on that machine so far because from a lot of help from friends i finally got through the process of how you set up like fusion will do let's say drive the g code for you but you still have to calculate your own feed rate and rpm for it to work properly really? Like it's not, you put the feed rate into basically the RPM and that's about all you can control because of the pitch of the pitch of the thing driving it is basically your feed rate. Yeah. Just took me a while. And luckily Andy had gone through this before me and I had never done it myself. Normally where you like single block through something, go real slow when you're trying to not crash. Well, Mm -hmm. this has to go a hundred percent. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's slow still but it's buried in coolant and yeah. you just push go and it goes and it's just you know completely concealed and you can't see what's going on and it got to the bottom and i didn't hear any pops and i was like i think it made it and it came back out and there was like chips sticking out of it and i was awesome. like oh no but then i looked in and it was perfect it works Lo- and i was lovely little part yeah how does it engage so you you can see behind me, it goes in yeah. the wall and then you turn it yeah. Yeah. and it locks in the oh, horizontal cool. position. It won't continue to turn Just the like, way you tighten it. Nice. Like a press fit. Basically, yeah. So it can go in and then twist and we're using it for, you know, all these different types of ways to mount something to the back clamp from the back side of the wall. I also did some roundovers, which are harder mm-hmm. than they sound too, to get them right. To get the little yeah. edges all blending and yeah, I was pretty stoked about it. Felt like a is that a two sided operation? Yeah. yeah, and I didn't get the best second side setup, so I missed a little bit of my roundover. But I have dreams of making it a one side, like a double sided roundover, so that then I just flip yeah. it over and deck it off. That'd but be nice. Someday need to sell some yeah, first. Cool. <laughs> Lovely little pot. Thanks. Yeah, I'm pretty cool. happy with that one. It's like the only thing so far we've found that makes sense to make on the mill for this assembly. Everything else is router yeah. based. And so you mentioned the other day that you'd thought about printing those. We did. We actually used to print. I, I still think they could probably perform well enough, but I know somebody's going to crank it too hard and break it. Is that with a printed thread or you tap the printed part? You tap it. Okay. You can do it a couple ways, but basically you just print it like you would pre drill the hole. And then you yeah. can use a tap through it. And it even in PLA, which is pretty brittle, it'll tap just fine. And they were performing. There's nothing up there right now. I got the part right here. They were performing perfectly fine up until I took it out to mm. try the aluminum one. That's cool. The other thing you can do apparently is like some kind of hot tap, I guess, where you oh, just wow. like get like an actual threaded thing a little bit warm. And then you can just use it as a tap in plastic like that just kind of funny yeah that's cool that was uh, this is like probably the best uh, selling point for me on the printer was that we could make these in like 30 minutes you know like i okay. design one change it 
and this took me half a day to make, you know, one, because <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. It's part of the process. Yeah. Do you have a sense of, like, is the aluminium part economical based on its cycle time? I think so. I think we should easily be able to put a bunch into a fixture. And mm. I mean, even the slowest, it was, God, I don't know, four minutes or something like that collectively. It's pretty fast because, cool. yeah. you know, coming from a small stock, finally, that may be something we can actually just like run and walk away from and rather than, you know, every yeah. time sitting there and that'd be satisfying. Yeah, it would. <laughs> yeah. Pretty stoked about that guy. Awesome. Yeah. It'd be nice to have a part that you can just set and forget. Oh my God. It's a dream, yeah. dream right? Yeah. Lights out. Yeah. I want a little palette. I mean, even uh, in vices, I think I could set three or four up at a time. It'd probably fine for a while, but yeah, I'd make some little pallets and then mm. the first side's easy enough to hold like a strip probably. And then you could flip them over into something. You, well, you can use the tap at that point, which is kind of nice. And... Yeah. Yeah. All the stuff that um, mm -hmm. Jay Pearson does with palletizing small parts. I love <laughs> I love watching those videos. I'm always like, how can I do this? What can I, I make? That, this is like the only thing that's ever come close to that for me. Yeah. 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 Well, so when do you go back? When you feel better or when your days are up? When my days are up and I don't have symptoms, I can go back to work. So hopefully I go on Monday. Yeah. Um, take the weekend to fully recover, hopefully. Yeah. Try and get my head back in the game. <laughs> well. <laughs> I'm sure that'll happen. Yeah, we'll have to. Feeling pretty weird at this stage. That's okay. Yeah, for sure. I I think I would struggle to not be productive, but I guess you get over it if you just can't do it. It's a weird thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've always been that person that can't not be doing something. But this week I've definitely found yeah. that I just couldn't do. I tried being useful a couple of times. No. Nah. <laughs> just became exhausted very quickly. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should head off. <laughs> yeah, cool. <man. laughs> you seem pretty Sp speak different. Sp speaking of being exhausted, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the hell I'm doing next few days. Yeah. Have you got stuff that's pressing at work? No, I did. We've taken on a few more job shop jobs, which has been nice. We got lucky enough that change a few things and all of a sudden get more inquiries and more people that are interested. That's good. Yeah, I've got a few smaller jobs to do. Maybe one that's pretty interesting I'll probably post something about. It's like a two-inch thick slab of walnut, kind of like a guitar pick-shaped coffee table with a giant chamfer on the entire thing, which I haven't totally figured out how I'm going to do yet, but mm -hmm. we'll figure it's it a multi -pass, out. multi-pass, multi-pass yeah. chamfer. Lots of passes, oh. yeah. Yeah, cool. That'll be fun. Yeah, and Ricky's just set up to... We're working on our the dowel part. It's going to be like a peg that goes on the wall yep <laughs> it may have failed ca catastrophically i've cut this really ghetto setup for a second op to cut the scoop little saddle part into it and it's kind of like held between some french cleats and a couple toe clamps <laughs> it's a round dowel though on one side so it's either gonna shoot off or be just fine <laughs> i don't know awesome i look forward to seeing that yeah i can get some action sh yeah fly off shots yeah nice yeah cool man all right well hope you feel better thank you and full um, full energy gem i'll be bouncing back next week yeah yeah hopefully <laughs> hopefully it's just a one week hopefully. thing man thank you yeah cool take care yep see ya bye bye